This video is going to be on platelet disorders. Now just a quick recap, when you have a bleeding blood vessel, the first step is going to be vasoconstriction. And then the second step, the exposed collagen will signal that a clot needs to be formed. So von Willebrand factor will bind. And from it, our platelets come in and it'll bind to that von Willebrand's factor with the glycoprotein GP1B. And then once it does that, it activates and degranulates basically. And degranulates and ADP causes another glycoprotein to be expressed. That's your GP2B and your 3A. And that glycoprotein likes to bind to fibrinogen. And fibrinogen is a drape and the drape that kind of aggregates and clumps all our playlists together and makes a neat temporary plug. That's our um, function of our platelet in a nutshell. So how do, can we tell if there's a problem with our playlist where we can do laboratory tests like bleeding time? The bleeding time is literally you just prick the patient and then wait for them to stop bleeding. And if you prick the patient and you cause bleeding, then you would expect platelets to stop the bleeding. So if the bleeding time is elevated, if the patient just keeps on bleeding and bleeding, you know there's a problem in the platelets. So platelet problem if elevated. It is very specific to the platelets. If the bleeding time is abnormal, then the platelets, there's something wrong with the platelets. If the bleeding time is normal, then the platelets are normal. Uh, it doesn't matter if the patient is bleeding out of the wazoo. If the bleeding time is normal, then the platelets are normal and the bleeding is due to something else. Okay, so it's very specific to the platelets. Another test we can do is Ristocetin. And Ristocetin tests for uh, von Willebrand factor and things that bind to von Willebrand factor. So I'll just write von Willebrand factor and the ability of it to bind, so binding. And uh, Ristocetin is just a, a old antibacterial that we don't use anymore. We just use it for this test and it'll cause platelets to clump if the von Willebrand factor is normal or if the things that bind to von Willebrand factors are norm normal. So those are your tests for platelets. All right, now that we have that background information, we can go into platelet disorders. And there are many things that cause platelet disorders. And when we talk about disorders in um, heme, we're talking about too much of something or too little of something. Too much of something, too much platelets, we call that thrombocytosis. And thrombocytosis can be caused by things like polycythemia, central thrombocytosis. We talked about that in previous videos. So that's thrombocytosis. Too little platelets is thrombocytopenia. That is two little platelets. And when you have two little platelets and you bleed, you'll have an increased bleeding time. Um, <clears throat> there are general causes of thrombocytopenia. We talked about any, any cause of aplastic anemia will cause it. Um, renal failure, like uremia, because um, the toxic substances will kill your thrombocytes, your platelets, essentially. Those are just general causes. In this video, we're gonna talk about a little more specific causes. In particular, Structural defects of our thymocytes or our platelets, so structural defects of platelets. And then our second category, we'll just call them immune responses against our platelets. So structural defects in our platelets, what can go wrong? Well, for starters, we can have a defect in our glycoprotein GP1B. We call that Bernard Sawyer disease. And Bernard Sawyer disease, we're lacking that GP1B. So we can't form that initial adhesion to von Willebrand factor. And our playlists are gonna look kinda funky. They're gonna be enlarged. They're enlarged and also um, because they're defective they don't live as long so they have a shortened lifespan short lifespan but the most important and uh, I guess the main reason we're talking about it here is without this glycoprotein we can't adhere to von Willebrand factor in the first place and we can't I guess set off the whole whole cascade so you're gonna have problems with 
bleeding, so you're gonna have increased bleeding time. Because your platelets don't live as long, you're gonna have thrombocytopenia, so decrease platelet count. And because you have decreased platelets, your megakaryocytes, the things that make platelet in the first place, will, will increase to try and compensate. So increase megakaryocytes. And just for a bonus, um, what do you think will happen to the Risto-Seaton test? Will it be normal or abnormal? I said tests von Willebrand factors and things that bind to it. This is a thing that binds to it. So your Risto-Seaton test is going to be abnormal. Risto-Seaton, abnormal. There's another structural defect in your playlist that I want to talk about. It's called Glas Glansman disease. And this is another <coughs> defect in a glycoprotein. Which do you think we're talking about? If it's not GP1B, then it'd be GP2 and 3. So this is a defect in GP2 and 3. What do those do again? They bind fibrinogen, and fibrinogen is a drape that kind of aggregates and kind of drapes over our, our platelets. So you can't bind that fibrinogen and you can't aggregate our platelets. It's a problem with aggregation. All right, problem with aggregation. And so if you take a sample of the platelets, you'll notice they don't clump together. Lab findings, you're gonna have increased bleeding time. What about your wrist is seen? Will that be normal or abnormal? Is there a problem with your von Willebrand factor? No. Is there a problem with things that bind to a von Willebrand factor? No. Uh, this doesn't bind to von Willebrand factor. So, ristocene is normal. And for the most part, your platelets are, are somewhat normal. They don't, you know, die early. So, you have a normal platelet count. So, those are your two structural defects. Let's move on to immune causes. I'm just going to clear the board because there's a few immune causes and I want to have enough space for us to talk about all of them. So immune causes. The first one I want to talk about is drug-induced immune thrombocytopenia. A lot of drugs can cause, I guess, a drug reaction that causes thrombocytopenia. The main one you need to know about is heparin. Heparin. And heparin binds to a protein called platelet factor 4. Found on your platelets. And when it binds to that, then IgG sees that complex and says that's not normal. I don't like that too much. So IgG will attack it and also activate the platelet. So that attacks and activates, causing it to form a thrombi, an inappropriate thrombi, a thrombi when there's no need for a thrombi. So you're going to have all these thrombi, and because you're making these thrombi, you're actually using up all your platelets. So your platelets are decreased because you're consuming them. So you make all these thrombi when you don't need it. So you use up all your platelets, and if you cut yourself, when you actually do need the thrombi, then you don't have enough platelets to make it. So you have increased bleeding time, but paradoxically, you have a ton of thrombi in your body. And the dead giveaway is you'll give a patient heparin and then they form a clot. That is not normal. Heparin is an anticoagulant, right? So how and on earth can they form a clot? It's because of this drug-induced thrombocytopenia. Very classic. So if you give a patient heparin and they have a pulmonary embolus or they have an MI or something, then you know you're dealing with this. Very easy to pick up on the question system. Just be aware of this. That's drug-induced thrombocytopenia. The second one I want to talk about is going to be Thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP. As much as we, we need von Willebrand's factor for, I guess, everything, um, we don't want to have too much, otherwise we'll have inappropriate thrombi. And so there's a metalloprotein, and so there's an enzyme, a metalloproteinase, um, they call it metal because it contains zinc, an enzyme that that cuts up aggregates of von Willebrand factor or multimeres of von Willebrand factor. So an enzyme that cuts multimeres of von Willebrand factor. We call this ADAM TS13, or just ADAM TS13. And this cuts the multimeters of von Willebrand factor to make sure we don't have too much. And that way we don't have inappropriate thrombi. If you have a deficiency in this, or more 
commonly um, an autoantibody inhibition of this. So deficiency or autoantibody inhibition, because we are talking about immune causes of thrombocytopenia. Then you can't cut the multimeres of von Willebrand factor and they'll start to clump and aggregate and cause inappropriate thrombi. So increased thrombi everywhere. So much thrombi in so many places that when you have blood, blood red blood cells that try and go through your blood vessels, they'll hit the thrombi and shear apart. What do we call that? We call that microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And if you recall from our video about microangiopathic anemia, you'll recall that I said this causes it and that we talk about in the future. Well, now it's a feature and now we're talking about here. And what do you see when you see that microangiopathy? You're gonna see the red blood cells shared apart. Those are called schistocytes. Schistocytes. And then just general lab findings of um, hem hemolytic anemia. So increased LDH, increased bilirubin, stuff like that. So increased LDH. You're gonna have thrombi everywhere. You're gonna have, um, you'll initially just have a fever, a headache, but then as the thrombi build and build, you're gonna have purpura. Purpura. You're gonna have renal failure because you're gonna have thrombi in your renal vessels, so renal failure. And probably the most important and uh, the most severe is neuro deficits once you get thrombi in your head. Long ago, the, the mortality rate was, was pretty high, but now um, you can do plasmapheresis. And this works pretty well. Your plasmapheresis, you're taking away any antibodies that might inhibit your atoms, TS13. That's thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or TCP. Another one I wanna talk about is gonna be immune thrombocytopenic purpura. The names are very, very similar and there's not much to really differentiate them. So you gotta know the mechanism down cold. And in an immune thrombocytopenic purpura, this is seen more in kids, kids, especially following a viral illness. After a viral illness, um, something happens and your body makes these antibodies against your own platelets. Why it does that? No one's quite sure, but it just does. So it makes these platelets, especially IgG, against your platelets. In particular, it's against G, P, two and three. Do you recall what those did? Those, that's the one that bound fibrinogen, yeah? And when your spleen sees this, sees platelets is covered by these antibodies, then it'll remove it, remove those platelets. So spleen removes platelets. Usually self-limiting. Um, you can give steroids if need be or if severe. And if it's really refractory or you just can't seem to get rid of it, then you can do a splenectomy because again, your spleen removes your platelets. So splenectomy would be curative, but that's on a very severe end. Um, usually acute, usually self-limited, usually in kids. If it's chronic, it's usually seen in adults. So chronic, seen in adults. And with most autoimmune diseases, more seen in women. And if that lady gets pregnant, then that antibody, because it's IgG, can cross the placenta, cause thrombocytopenia in the kid or the fetus. Thrombocytopenia in fetus. That's immune thrombocytopenic purpura. The last but not least is gonna be hemolytic uremic syndrome. I wanted to save this for last because it kind of draws on everything we've talked about so far. Hemolytic uremic syndrome is commonly seen in kids, but instead of following a viral illness, it follows an infection, um, commonly E. coli, O157H7, that's the serotype. Or Shigella, or Camp, Campylobacter. These are all things that cause bloody diarrhea because they have this very, very severe toxin. That toxin actually damages our endothelium. So much so that it causes widespread damage and then widespread thrombi to form. So thrombi, 
inappropriate thought by, and again, that consumes platelets, so you get decreased platelets. If that toxin wasn't bad enough, this toxin also blocks Adam TS13. So decrease Adam TS13. So you're getting a ton, a ton of thrombi. And because you have all these thrombi, you get symptoms similar to thrombotic, thrombocytic, penic purpura. So you're gonna have microangiopathic anemia. You're gonna have purpura. You're gonna have renal failure. You're gonna have all of these. But there are a couple of differences. The difference is that here, instead of initially getting things like headache and fever, here, because it's due to things like E. coli, shigella, you're gonna get bloody diarrhea. So that is a big thing that separates it, the bloody diarrhea. And like I said, you're gonna get all these symptoms, microangiopathic anemia, purple, renal failure. But the big one is gonna be renal failure. Acute renal failure, you're gonna have oliguria, basically not enough urine because your kidneys are shot. And it's quite common, so you need to be able to pick it up well. Um, treatment is usually supported, supportative or plasmapheresis. That does it for your platelet disorders. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.